thank you everyone for joining us for AAC and its role in the IEP on Wednesday, September 13th at 6.30. Our guest presenter, Kristen Ellis, speech language pathologist, argumentative and alternative communication specialist. The ARC's disclaimer, the ARC of Lehigh Northampton County's advocacy department does not employ lawyers nor provide legal advice. This training or any other provided by ARC advocacy department does not constitute or imply the endorsement or recommendation or favoring of the providing party or any employees or contracting acting on its behalf. This webinar is being provided for educational and informative purposes only. And with that, I would like to introduce our guest presenter, Kristen Ellis. Good evening and welcome to AAC and its role in the IEP. Um, I have presented this training quite a few times to different organizations, um, the ARC being one of them, but also um, to other parent support groups and things like that, just trying to get that information out there to everyone. Um, so I appreciate the ARC you know, bring me back at kind of peak time of the year, um, coming back into the school year where a lot of things are starting to be discussed already. Um, and a lot of revision meetings are happening. Um, because of things that happened over the summer are kids that have obtained devices and things like that, or kids that they're feeling need devices. So that's a little bit about um, myself is that I have my bachelor's and my master's degree from East Stroudsburg University of Pennsylvania. Um, I have worked in a variety of different types of settings, um, public schools, charter schools, um, and approved private schools for varying diagnoses. So including autism, um, emotional disturbance, blind and visually impaired. Um, I've worked in a variety of different healthcare settings as well, um, including outpatient clinics, skilled nursing facilities, and even a little bit of home health. Um, I'm currently employed as the director of speech and language therapy um, and an AAC specialist with Behavioral Health Associates, which is located in Carbon County, Pennsylvania. Um, and I, uh, on top of that, I own my own private practice that I opened in 2020 amidst COVID. Um, and we specialize in everything augmentative and alternative communication, from trialing devices to funding communication devices to doing um, consultations um, in school districts or for school districts um, to evaluations um, and trialing a bunch, uh, bunch of different things as well. Um, some of my disclosures, just because I do this for organizations that require this, so it is a slide that's already built in, um, is my financial disclosures is, of course, that I'm a full-time employee of Behavioral Health Associates, um, and I receive my salary through them. I am the owner of Time to Talk Therapy Services, which is my private um, practice. Um, you're going to hear me mention it a few times, but I within um, the presentation as well as I pull some references from it, that I'm the organizer and developer of a summer AAC camp that we call the Everyone Deserves a Voice AAC Summer Camp. And some non-financial disclosures about myself is I'm a member of the American Speech and Hearing Association. Um, I'm an affiliate of SIG-12, which is the Augmentative and Alternative Communication Special Interest Group. I'm a member of USAC, which is the United States Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And I'm a member of ISAC, which is the International Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And I do pre presentations for all of those organizations as well, um, which is why that's all included. So before we can kind of delve into the IEP end of things, a lot of people even just start to ask me the, what I refer to as the five W's of AAC. Um, so what is an AAC device? Sometimes people are unsure as to what is kind of classified as that device, you know, and it's, first of all, we have to talk about augmented and alternative communication before we can kind of get into devices. Um, and of course, it's an area of clinical practice that supplements or compensates for impairments in speech and language production and or comprehension. This includes spoken and or written modes of communication. And AAC does fall under a broader umbrella of assistive technology, um, which assistive technology um, or is the use of any equipment, tool, or strategy to improve 
our functional daily living um, for individuals with disabilities or limitations. Um, it can, AAC itself uses a variety of different techniques and tools to help an individual express their thoughts, their ideas, their wants and needs, their feelings. Um, and that can include any of the following, manual signs, gestures, finger spelling, tangible objects, line drawings, picture communication boards and letter boards. And of course, the one that a lot of people are going to be talking about during, and we're going to be talking about during this uh, webinar is the speech generating devices. AAC is augmentative when it's used to supplement existing speech. So these are kiddos that are verbal or have some element of verbal speech, but we're using it to supplement that speech. It can be alternative when it's used in place of that spoken language because it's absent or it's not functional. And that can also be in a temporary fashion so used um, for patients that are post-operatively unable to um, talk as well. Um, and these can appear in any form. It can be low tech or no tech, mid tech or high tech. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what those terms mean. So your no tech or low tech communication means that there, there's no batteries required. There's no um, you know, speakers being used, nothing like that. These are things that are printed on paper. They're laminated. They're, they could be spiral bound. They could be in fancy communication books, but they're, for all intents and purposes, there's no technology behind them. Um, some of your mid-tech communication devices are your devices that there are batteries required. Um, a lot of times these are the technology devices that have what are referred to as digitized voices. Um, so they, it records like your voice um, over it, or it sounds kind of more, um, robot, robotics probably not the best word, but that's the word that's coming to mind right now. Um, you know, it has more of that sound to it. They're, they are limited in the communication that they can provide as well. Um, for example, the, the switches that are shown in the middle, you know, they have about like a 20 to 30 second record time. Um, so, which means you have to erase and redo if you wanna change your message specifically on what's considered the Big Mac um, or the Little Mac. Um, some of these Go Talk 20s, you have to create and print the overlays and then you have to put them into the device and you have to program all of that as well. Um, so they can be very time consuming to manage. Um, in addition to low tech devices can be cumbersome to manage as well. The other one that kind of falls into this category that um, is, it can sometimes be referred to as a high tech, but for all intents and purposes, we are not going to include the Logan Prox talker into a high tech device um, as it doesn't have some of the same features that many of the other high tech devices do have. So Logan Prox talker is very similar to um, a picture exchange communication system or a PEX system, but in which those tiles that the pictures are located on are, are able to be recorded on. You are given so many pre-recorded um, tiles and you can also make your own tiles um, and put images on and it allows you to sequence up to five words um, or phrases onto the device that it will speak um, in sentences. The high-tech devices for the purpose of the majority of trainings that you'll probably attend in regards to communication devices are the ones that are considered the tablet-based communication systems. They are um, they are basically like mini computers that are used to assist individuals with communicating. Um, you'll hear them referred to as dynamic displays. Um, these vo there's tons of voice options here. The possibilities of the language within the systems are more infinite. Um, there's a lot more things you can change within the settings, like changing the rate of the voice or the pitch of the voice, the volume of the voice, um, the um, if you want from a different country, you can pick all those kinds of things. You can pick bilingual voices and, um, and things like that that you can't really do on any of anything else but these devices. And these are the devices we're going to be talking about more um, today as we go through this um, webinar. Um, and I have tried to be all encompassing, you know, that there's Toby Dynavox references on here, Smartbox, PRC Saltillo. Um, that everyone's kind of remaining happy within 
in, within my uh, AAC bag today. Um, so now that we know what a device is, you know, the most popular question I tend to get is, well, who can benefit from it or who's eligible to have and use an AAC device? And everyone, people of all ages can use AAC. You know, it doesn't matter um, what the severity range of skills are. Um, it can be trouble with any kind of speech and language skills, you know, can help. Uh, some people that use a, they'll use it throughout their lifetime, but others may only use it for a short period of time. There's no minimum age. This is something that I see quite frequently. I have a lot of little guys that come to me um, because no one is giving them the time of day to explore augmentative communication. Um, but time is precious. So you'll see me mention it later on that the earlier, the better. Um, and there's clearly no maximum age either. Um, and that's for purposes of individuals who have strokes or suffer traumatic brain injury. We can introduce anyone to a device at any age. And there's no prerequisites for someone to use augmentative and alternative communication, especially in the realms of the high-tech devices. Everyone thinks, you well, you have to be able to use picture exchange before you can use a high-tech dynamic display. It's completely not true. Um, those myths have be, been debunked several times that that's not the case. Or I've heard that individuals with intellectual disability cannot use a communication device, and that's not true either. Um, so where do we end up getting these devices once we kind of identify the, the who, right, within that? Um, there's big companies that you can go through, the, the big um, organizations that exist, like Talk To Me Technologies and AbleNet, PRC Saltillo and Smartbox and Toby. Um, but many of you that may be on this webinar maybe have gone through the experience of getting a communication device through your school district or through your local intermediate unit. There are even outpatient clinics similar to my own that kind of specialize in this as well. Um, and many of the big hospitals also have assistive technology um, evaluation teams. Um, but sometimes these evaluations tend to be entire days. So I know a lot of the kiddos that I work with do not do well with those six, seven, eight hour evaluations. But so there's definitely like a wide range of locations that you can obtain a device through. You know, why should we be getting a child a device? what we want out of them having a communication device is that we're establishing a means of communication and social interaction. You know, we want to promote language development. We want to support cognitive development and learning, and we want to enhance work and educational opportunities for these individuals. We want to help facilitate speech development, um, clarify speech production, and enhance participation in society, which I know in my school that I work in is the goal for all of our kids, regardless if they're in kindergarten or if they're super seniors. When is the right time to get AAC? Um, this is kind of like the the age old question of like, when do we do it? Well, they're too little, they're too, they're too old. You hear all of this, but it should be considered for any child when their speech output is not adequate to communicate everything that a child wants or needs to communicate. So some questions that you can actually ask yourselves to determine, you know, if a device might be something that's appropriate is considering the child's frustration levels. But on the flip side of that, considering the adult frustration levels or the, commu the communication partners, their frustration. Um, what is their access to their school curriculum? What's their participation like in their classroom activities? Are they able to participate? Do they have the ability to participate in that circle time routine just like everybody else or in that ELA lesson or that math lesson just like everybody else in that classroom that is able to verbally speak? What's their ability to demonstrate the, the knowledge base that they have already to their teachers that they can show that they can answer their questions or offer a comment during um, different things? Their access to their home and their community environment. What does that look like? Um, 
their ability to interact appropriately with family and peers and those social interactions. And what's their independence like in developmentally appropriate daily activities for their age? If you're questioning any of these or many of these, then an augmentative and alternative communication system might be something worth exploring. So once we've decided that we're going to do that, we have to go through the AAC assessment process, which is a very, it can be a very lengthy process. I, in, in my mind, I feel that some organizations make this be more difficult than it needs to be. Um, because as long as the individuals are kind of familiar with what they're doing and what the process needs to be and what it needs to look like, it does not need to be a year, two, three year long occurrence. But along that continuum of this process, you have to decide what you're looking at. Are you looking at lower, low tech, mid tech, high tech? Are you looking at switches? What kinds of things are you looking at? And that's that that's part of the of the trouble is some people don't know where to start. So as a part of this process, not only do you have to kind of decide where you're gonna start, um, you have to start with a functional communication assessment, which the goal of that is to get a full picture of receptive and expressive communication skills. Um, typically these are done as a combination of formal and informal strategies, including in mine, I do parent interview. I do observations within the classrooms. I might do teacher interview. I might do teacher rating scales. Um, I want to know commun the communication skills they have, but also the challenges and the needs that they have as a communicator. Um, like, do they need to order their lunch? Do they need to check in for doctor's appointments? Do they have a job where they need to be greeting people and they're not able to do that? Um, all these things I kind of try to figure out based on all of those forms that I have. How does their current communication compare to developmental expectations? So they're 10, what should they be able to do communication-wise as a 10-year-old? I also have to get some information on their information on their vision, their hearing, and their fine and gross motor skills because all of these systems work together in order to access a device. Um, and I did just use some graphics of things that I use in my evaluation toolkit, and these are just some of them. I might use the RESCA um, social communication inventory to get an idea of their social communication skills. And I might give these to parents, caregivers, teachers. I've given them to um, wraparound services providers as well. Um, because sometimes I do like to compare what's the communication look like in the home versus what does it look like in the community versus what does it look like at school. So it's nice and I'll include the results from all three. Um, I use a lot of informal testing from the AAC Evaluation Genie, which is an application on an iOS device um, that looks at several different components within a device from how big do the pictures need to be to different um, subtests that allow you to see, are they able to read? Um, and recognize a word that goes with a picture when the words all look very similar. So are they are they figuring out what that word means? And of course, there's standardized assessments included in this. So one of the ones that I use for specifically for my nonverbal kiddos that come to me is the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. I like this one because it has been strongly correlated with nonverbal IQ. So it does kind of give us an idea as to what level of vocabulary we're looking at. We then have to look at system design. Um, did I skip a slide? I did. I thought I skipped a slide. I was like, that's not right. Um, so step two is we have to do what's called feature matching. And there's tons of checklists that are out there that you can utilize when you're kind of determining this, or even as a parent, like you're start. many parents kind of do a lot of this research before they even go to providers um, to complete evaluations if they decide to go outside of the school system. You want to basically compare each augmentative and alternative communication systems features to the child's needs. So what does the child need to do? They do they need to be able to send text messages? Do they need to be able to receive email? Do they need to be able to have a motor planning application? 
because they're they benefit from motor planning. And that's something that we know. Do they need a text-based system? Like there's no picture support. Do they need um, high contrast? And then when you start to figure out these things that they need, you can start to look at the other systems that are out there. So then you can look at language systems and access methods and different tech features that might be needed within that. And what systems have those? Um, so you can see on the checklist that's here, you know, it's device one, two, and three, right? You hear the the dreaded, like they have to try all three devices thing, which we'll come back to that later on. But so you might be comparing three different devices to determine what features do they have um, and which one might be a better bet to start with. So system, our, our system design, which is step three amongst this whole process is, you know, this is where we get to customize things for a system for trial. So selecting the vocabulary, de deciding what type of interface features we need and what kind of access methods we need. Um, so do we need to use one of the millions of switches that exist on the left to access it? Or are we able to do um, selection with our eyes, with our head, or with our finger? or our toes. I've seen people that access with their toes, so I'm not gonna discount any of that. Um, so we need to know those things because depending on the access method, you may not be able to do an iPad, for example, um, because the iPads are just not able to do some of those access methods, or they can be a little bit more glitchy is the way to put it, because they're just not as easily designed to do those things. So then we get to move into, we've done the customizing of different, you know, maybe we're gonna try all two different apps um, or two different systems. We've done some customizing. So now we're gonna try it. Um, we do need to, the, the whole rule of we need to try on more than one system um, that fits the child's need is, is not completely um, wrong, but sometimes the amount of time that that takes for some organizations is not completely accurate. Um, so we're focusing a lot on aided language input during our trialing of systems, which means it's basically that we're modeling a lot for them without expectation, which I do whole separate trainings on modeling and what that looks like. So I'm not going to dive into that. That's not the purpose of this webinar. Um, but you want to be taking data on what is going on, like words that you're modeling and are they able to model it? Are they able to then access it independently after you've modeled? And there's a lot of supporting the family that this is what this needs to look like. So this is, you know, we're going to do a session in my in my clinic, but now this is what I want you to do. And this is how I want you to incorporate it at home for the next week. And then I'm usually looking at data over the course of four weeks and let, and a lot of my clients get their devices funded through their insurances. So unless the insurance requires otherwise, I will do somewhere between four and five, four and six weeks, I would say. Um, but I like to have at least four weeks worth of data to support that, you know, they are progressing with the use of the device. So once I have all that data, we can move into the funding, right? The goal is to give everyone a voice out of this. You know, are we going to do school funded or insurance funded um, or grant funded? I should add that in there, too, because there's grants out there that exist as well to fund communication devices. But part of when you're going the insurance funded route, and this is where a lot of people struggle, is that each insurance company, specifically like the companies that are listed on this PowerPoint slide, they're all insurances that will fund communication devices. But sometimes what they're looking for in reports is different. And if you don't know that, you can easily get denied for the child to get the, or adult to get the device. That, that initial AAC evaluation has to be completed by a speech language pathologist as well. Um, it can't come from any other provider. It can't come from a doctor. It can't come from a teacher. It can't come from an occupational therapist. It has to be a speech language pathologist that is licensed and certified. Um, you need to have accurate insurance information. I can't tell you how many times I've had inaccurate insurance information or the insurance has changed. 
over the course of the time that we're trialing things. All super important things. On top of, not only does the report have to come from a licensed and certified speech language pathologist, a physician prescription needs to be written for an order for the communication device. Just like you receive physician prescriptions for medications and other durable medical equipment, whether it be crutches or um, uh, breast pumps, right? Things like that that are durable medical equipment that you typically need a doctor's order to get. You need that for a communication device as well, which is that confuses people as well. The a medical doctor needs to sign off on the recommendation of the communication device. Um, otherwise it can't go any further. And there's lots of forms that need, that can be very redundant that need to be signed by parents and caregivers as well in order to submit everything. Okay. So we've got our device. We've gone through all of that process. Now we can talk about the role of that device in your child's IEP. So there are several sections of the IEP that should, and in my clients at my school, do have reference to the device in some way. So those sections are section one, which is the special consideration section. Section two, the present levels of fun academic achievement and functional performance. Of course, the goals and objectives section. Um, section six, which is your specially designed instruction. Um, under section six, the supports for school personnel, related services, and extended school year if something that is focusing on augmentative communication is being recommended or the AAC goals are being the ones that are identified to work on. So now we're going to go into each section and what that kind of looks like. And I'll give you ideas on wording and things like that as to what um, maybe for your child it should look like. All right. So special considerations. This is always one that gets missed like time and time again. I can't tell you how many IEPs I look at that do not have this tiny little box checked. The question says. Does the student need an assistive technology device and or service? If your child has a communication device, the, these should be checked yes. And this is just referring to any, remember we talked about assistive technology as a broad term. So this is actually anything. Slant boards, pencil grips, um, weighted vests, um, the rubber bands on the chairs, any, any, flexible seating, standing desk, anything is all assistive technology that the child needs to access for part of their, to access their curriculum. So not only is the communication device heavily fall under here, but anything your child needs throughout the day or their course at school. And it's that tiny little box. So it's easily missed. Section two is the is the big one that you it does tend to be usually recommended with or mentioned within the present levels of academic achievement and functional performance, which are actually, you know, two separate sections of the document. So usually academic achievement refers to kind of all of the academic things going on. So you'll see, you know, that you might see Dibble scores or you're going to see. Um, information about standardized tests, like the PSSAs and things like that may be in there, or the PASA might be in there if they're taking the alternative assessment. You might see all of their grades, you might see all of their attendance. And then when you typically when you go down to functional performance, that's where all the related services talk. Um, in which case, your teacher should be mentioning the device, but so should your related services people. Um, because and I don't mean like just the speech language pathologist. Because technically, if it's a communication device and it's been identified that it's needed across all school settings, that device should be mentioned by every single person working with that individual. 
and how they're using it with that individual because it's it's good to read and it's good to see that oh with the occupational therapist they don't use it independently nearly as much as they do with the speech therapist well so how do we change that that's what needs to be changed and you know we're striving for progress here not perfection um lots of people think we have to have like perfection going on here with the use of a communication device and that's not that's not how it works um, and it does take time. So within these sections, you should be seeing mention of, you know, um, student is utilizing touch chat software on a dedicated iPad to access their academic curriculum. They engage in circle time activities. They're able to answer yes, no questions. They're able to answer WH questions. So you should see these, this type of um, narrative kind of showing up. Um, and then within the speech data, you're gonna be seeing more data-driven things. Like they're able to do this with 75% accuracy or they're able to comment 20 times over the course of a 30 minute session, things like that within that functional performance. All right, section five, the goals and the objectives. Another thing that I, I swear I, I've looked at many IEPs and that I can't say enough times that the goals are not written well enough for our kiddos with communication devices. And usually the response I get back is they don't know how to write the goals for someone that uses a communication device. Um, I'm here to tell you that there's tools out there to help your speech language pathologists to do this. Some are free. Some are relatively inexpensive when you're talking about like assessments and data collection um, that are out there. So the pragmatics profile for people who use AAC, um, the quad profile, uh, which is checklist for profiling different language samples, um, as well as the dynamic AAC goals grid, which has now been updated to version three. Um, version two is no longer being used. This is like within the last week or so, version three was released. Um, these are all free resources that are basically checklists that can be utilized to determine the different language skills and functions that your child is demonstrating or not able to currently demonstrate. The And they can be used with someone who already has an AAC device or someone that is new and is just going to be getting a communication device. The augmentative and alternative communication profile is a paid resource. And that one is meant more for someone that already uses a communication device. You're rating different language skills in the four different competencies within AAC on a scale of three, two, or one. So either they frequently do it, they, they um, sometimes do it, or they seldom do it. So because they're asking it in that way, I find it more useful to use with individuals who have communication devices already. Um, and you can re-administer these items for re-evaluations or annual IEP meetings to see growth. And you can say that these skills are now mastered or these skills are now able to be done or before they weren't doing sentences that had a subject, verb, and an object. And now they're able to do that. So it shows growth. Even if your IEP goal, the way it is written, has not been mastered, it still shows the progress. Remember, progress, not perfection. The next part is the specially designed instruction part. Um, and this is where I list in my kiddos at the school, we list all of the things related to the augmented communication devices. We list the AAC prompt hierarchy. We list communication partner strategies. We provide wording for the availability of the AAC device in, across settings and environments. Um, we talk about there being low, the availability of low tech boards that mirror the student's AAC system, not a completely different system. It needs to actually mirror theirs or it's kind of pointless. This is also where I mention if the child is following specific programs or curriculums related to augmentative communication. 
Are we doing a core word of the week? Are we doing a core word of the day? Are we following tell me AAC that's put out by the attainment company? Are we following um, a core word of, or core words of the month? There's curriculums like that for like September, October, and going by a month base of certain vocabulary words. If we're following certain curriculums like that, this is where I encourage my speech language pathologist to make sure it's written. Um, you can also mention it in your present levels as well, that it's something you're already doing. But if the child is to move from the district and go somewhere else, you want to make sure they know what you're doing or what you've been doing. I found this on the so this is a graphic that's just showing some communication partner strategies when I was talking about putting that in the IEP. Some of those, um, and it, usually the blurb I use has them all like written out, you know, providing ample wait time, you know, giving, attributing meaning to the things that they do say on the device, modeling, lots of modeling, um, using different strategies to respond to the communication and, you know, different prompts and cues that we might provide to them. You know, Assistive Wear has wonderful supports that are out there and wonderful graphics like these. Um, but, you know, they put out good information as well, saying that, you know, all AAC users need to be supported in a way that's specific and personal to them. So, yes, we're saying putting communication partner strategies, but it might look a little bit different for your AAC user you might need to modify and change some things or add things in or take things away based on what they need. You know, good communication partners end up listening and asking about how we can better support the, the use of that device. And Assistive Wear is also a company that has a lot of resources and references to curriculums that utilize core vocabulary as well. The related services section. So it, it's gotten better over the years. I've seen, you know, many places get real a lot better with talking about their speech language therapy services and what they look like. Something that's really important is the fact that it's being special um, specified individual or group. Um, because there's a big difference between the two. And honestly, for an AAC user, there should be a mixture of services. There should be individual therapy for structured teaching and really taking the time to break down where things are and what a comment is and when do we comment. And there's good comments and there's bad comments. But then you need the group element as well because you need to take those skills that you've taught and now it needs to be generalized in a group setting with other people. Well, now we're going to talk about the weekend. This, this is the time that Ms. Kristen was talking about that we're going to use these comments. And something that I don't see a whole lot of that I wish I was seeing more of is the consultative time, which is not direct time with the student. This might be time that you're spending programming the device that you're making supports to go with the device, that you're talking to the classroom teacher on things that they need, what's going right, what's going wrong, what do we need to fix, what do we need to change? And I usually put that in. Um, and most of my device users have 30 minutes a month of consultative time um, that I'm adding to that. And <laughs> it never fails. I go way over that anyway. Um, but at least I'm capturing some of what I'm doing on the consultative time. That's also, I use some of that to um, analyze log reports from the communication devices. If I have the data logging turned on, I'll do that. Um, so just an example of, you know, how it can be worded that, you know, it's once weekly, 30 minutes. Now my kids, we write our IEPs in minutes per month. So for example, ours would be 120 minutes per month which basically equates to once a week. Supports for school personnel. This is the one that's always missing. And this is the one that I always hear families complaining about, or they come to me, or I get these really frustrated phone calls um, about, I feel like my 
child's teacher doesn't know how to use the device at all, or it doesn't get turned on. It just stays in the backpack. The same thing's on from breakfast time that they don't know what they're doing with the device and how to kind of implement that within the school setting. So, and really what should be a part of the child's IEP if they have a communication device of any kind is some type of, within the support for school personnel, is instruction in the use and implementing the communication device. Now, this is just a snippet from one IEP. So they are referencing instruction on the use of text-to-speech um, and speech-to-text software. And what that looks like, how many sessions, how long the sessions are, where that's going to be. So I typically recommend for my students that my staff go through two AAC trainings a year, one in the beginning of the year, like when we're coming off of um, summer break and everyone's coming out of beach mode and going back into school mode. And then I do the second one after the winter break after we've all become very sluggish after eating all the great food after the holidays, right? And as a refresher to starting up the year. So two longer breaks and I do the refreshers. Um, and I do that for all of my teachers. I train my teachers simultaneously. I've done it the other way where I've done, you know, a training per classroom. It's very time consuming. So, and it's much better to put them all in the same room at the same time to hear the same thing. Then you don't get a lot of this hearsay third person type thing of, well, Kristen said this and Kristen, I heard her say that, you know, when they're all in one room, it's much easier. And you have, I've noticed you have less of that hearsay and the twisting of the words. The extended school year section. So this is the section where you might have it in or you may not. So for example, I have kids that attend my AAC summer camp as their extended school year program. So in that case, there would be reference to the device within this extended school year section. Another instance that you would have reference to the communication device is when they're selecting the goals to be targeted. There might be reference to the communication device in here that these are goals that are targeted with the use of the communication device. So those things should be mentioned if that's kind of what's expected. And that's just some pictures from um, my camp that kind of acts as an ESY program for kids, not just in Carbon County, but actually several surrounding counties we have attending our program now. Um, unfortunately, I did not update the picture to have the 2024 camp yet because the flyers aren't done yet. So I apologize for that. Um, but just to kind of show how we do use it across activities and kind of what it looks like within yeah, setting that we're fully targeting the communication device all day long. Questions?